So, what did you get Hercules for cat Halloween? What the... Was, it, was I supposed to get him something? Yeah, you're supposed to get him something every night. Every night? How many nights are there in cat Halloween? It runs through Christmas. That's a... Whew, that's a big commitment for a cat holiday. Yeesh, don't say that on Tumblr. You're starting to sound like a bigot. Has Vincent gotten that text yet? Eh, it shouldn't be much longer. Good, because I can't wait to get out of here. Oh yeah, me neither. Wait, what? How are you supposed to get out of here? I thought you were just helping me escape. Oh no, 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 no. I said I'd help you switch bodies with Bizarre MCP, which I did. But the spell I sent Vincent should help me switch bodies with him, effectively trapping Vincent here in the Shadow Realm. But what? Ooh boy, looks like MCP done found himself in another pickle. I swear that boy could fall head first into a barrel of titties and come out sucking his thumb. Looks like you'll have to find out next time, cause we're about to be knee deep in a brand spanking new spooky story. Happy Cat Halloween, y'all! As soon as his mother had closed the bedroom door, Martin burrowed down under the blankets. For him, this was one of the best times of the day. In that long, warm hour between waking and sleep, his imagination would take him almost anywhere. Sometimes he would lie on his back with the blankets drawn up to his nose and his pillow on top of his forehead so that only his eyes looked out. This was his spaceman game, and the pillow was his helmet. He traveled through sparkling light years past Jupiter so close that he could almost see the storm raging on its surface, then swung in on Neptune, chilly and green, and Pluto, beyond. On some nights, he would travel so far that he was unable to return to Earth, and he would drift further and further into the outer reaches of space until he became nothing but a tiny speck, winking in the darkness and he fell asleep. At other times, he was captain of a U-boat, trapped thousands of feet below the surface. He would have to squeeze along cramped and darkened passages to open up stopcocks, with water flooding in on all sides, and elbow his way along a torpedo tube in order to escape. He would come up to the surface, into the chilly air of the bedroom, gasping for air. Then he would crawl right back down to the very end of the bed, but the sheets and the blankets were tucked in real tight. He was a coal miner, making his way through the narrowest of fissures, with millions of tons of carboniferous rock on top of him. He never took a flashlight to bed with him. This would have revealed that the inside of his space helmet didn't have any dials or knobs or breathing tubes, and that the submarine wasn't greasy or metallic and crowded with complicated valves, and that the grim black coal face at which he so desperately hewed was nothing but a clean white sheet. Earlier that evening, he had been watching a program on potholing on television and he was keen to try it. He was going to be the leader of an underground rescue team trying to find a boy who had wedged himself in a crevice. It would mean crawling through one interconnected passage after another, then down through a water-filled sump until he reached the tiny cavern where the boy was trapped. His mother sat on the end of the bed, and kept him talking. He was going back to school in two days' time, and she kept on telling him how much she was going to miss him. He was going to miss her too, and Tiggy, the golden retriever, and everything here at Home Hill. More than anything, he was going to miss his adventures under the blankets. You couldn't go burrowing under bedclothes when you were at school. Everybody would rag you too much. He had always thought his mother was beautiful, and tonight was no exception. Although he wished that she would go away and let him start his potholing, what made her beauty all the more impressive was the fact that she would be 33 next April, which Martin considered to be prehistoric. His best friend's mother was only 33, and she looked like an old lady by comparison. Martin's mother had bobbed brunette hair and a wide, gorgeous face without a single wrinkle, and dark brown eyes that were always filled with love. It was always painful going back to school. 
He didn't realize how much it hurt her, too. How many times she sat on his empty bed and he was away, her hand pressed against her mouth and her eyes filled with tears. Dad will be back on Thursday, she said. He wants to take us all out before you go back to school. Is there anywhere special you'd like to go? Can we go to that Chinese place? The one where they give you those cracker things? Pangs? <laughs> yes, I'm sure we can. Dad was worried you were going to say McDonald's. She stood up and kissed him. And for a moment, they were very close, face to face. He didn't realize how much he looked like her. They were both staring into a kind of mirror. He could see what he would have looked like if he had been a woman. And she could see what she would have looked like if she had been a boy. They were two different manifestations of the same person. And it gave them a secret intimacy that nobody else could understand. Good night, she said. Sweet dreams. And for a moment, she laid a hand on top of his head, as if she could sense that something monumentous was going to happen to him. Something that could take him out of her reach. Forever. Good night, Mom, he said, and kissed her cheek. which was softer than anything he'd ever touched. She closed the door. He lay on his back for a while, waiting, staring at the ceiling. His room wasn't completely dark. A thin slice of light came in from the top of the door, illuminating the white paper lantern that hung above his bed so that it looked like it was a huge, pale planet, which it often was. He stayed where he was until he heard his mother closing the living room door, and then he wriggled down beneath the blankets. He cupped his hand over his mouth like a microphone and said, Underground Rescue Squad 3, reporting for duty. Hello, Underground Rescue Squad 3. Are we glad you're here? There's a boy trapped and legs elbow, 225 meters down, past Devil's Corner. He's 17 years old and he's badly injured. Okay, headquarters, we'll send somebody down there straight away. I'll have to be your very best man. It's really dangerous down there. It's started to rain and all the caves are flooded. You've probably got an hour, at the most. Don't worry, we'll manage it. Roger and out. Martin put on his equipment, his thermal underwear, his boots, his backpack, and his goggles. Anybody who was watching would have seen nothing more than a boy-shaped lump under the blankets, wriggling and jerking and bouncing up and down, but by the time he was finished, he was fully dressed for crawling his way down to Devil's Corner. His last radio message was, Headquarters, I'm going in. Be careful, Underground Rescue Squad 3. The rain's getting heavier. Martin lifted his head and inhaled a lungful of chilly bedroom air. Then he plunged downward into the first crevice that would take him down into the caves. The rock ceiling was dangerously low, and he had to crawl his way like a commando on his elbows. He tore the sleeve of his waterproof jacket on the protruding rock, and he gashed his cheek. But he was so heroic that he simply wiped away the blood with the back of his hand and carried on crawling forward. It wasn't long before he reached a tight, awkward corner, which was actually the end of the bed. He had to negotiate it by lying on his side, reaching into the nearest crevice for a handhold and heaving himself forward inch by inch. He had only just squeezed himself around this corner when he came to another, and he had to struggle his way around it in the same way. The air in the caves was growing more and more stifling and Martin was already uncomfortably hot, but he knew he had to go on. The boy in Leg's elbow was counting on him, just like the rest of Underground Rescue Squad 3, and the whole world above ground, which was waiting anxiously for him to emerge. He wriggled onward, his fingers bleeding until he reached the sump. This was a ten-meter section of tunnel, which was completely flooded with black, chilly water. Five potholers had drowned in it since the caves were first discovered, two of them experts. Not only was the sump flooded, it had a tight bend right in the middle of it, with rocky protrusions that could easily snag a potholder's belt or his backpack. Martin hesitated for a moment, but then he took a deep breath of stale air and plunged beneath the surface. The water was stunningly cold, but Martin swam along the tunnel with powerful, even strokes until he reached the bend. Still holding his breath, he angled himself sideways and started to tug himself between the jagged, uncompromising rocks. He was almost through when one of the straps of his backpack was caught 
and he found himself entangled. He twisted around, trying to reach behind his back so that he could pull the strap free from the rock, but he succeeded only in winding it even more tightly. He tried twisting around the other way, but now the strap tightened itself into a knot. He had been holding his breath for so long now that his lungs were hurting. Desperately, he reached into his pocket and took out his clasp knife. He managed to unfold the blade, bend his arm back, and slash and slash at the tightened strap. He missed it with his first two strokes, but his third stroke managed to cut it halfway through. His eyes were bulging and he was bursting for air, but he didn't allow himself to give in. One more cut and the strap abruptly gave way. Martin kicked both legs and swam forward as fast as he could. He reached the end of the sump and broke the surface, taking in huge grateful breaths of frigid subterranean air. He had beaten the sump. There were more hazards ahead of him. The rainwater from the surface had already begun to penetrate the lower reaches of the cave system. He could hear water rushing through crevices and clattering through galleries. In less than half an hour, every pothole would be flooded and there would be no way of getting back out again. Martin pressed on, sliding on his belly through a fissure that was barely more than 30 centimeters high. He was bruised and exhausted, but he had almost reached Devil's Corner. From there, it was only a few meters to Leg's elbow. Rainwater trickled from the low limestone ceiling and coursed down the side of the fissure, but Martin didn't care. He was already soaked, and he was crawling at last into Devil's Corner. He slid across the narrow vertical crevice called Leg's Elbow and peered down it, trying to see the trap boy. Hello, he called. Is anybody there? Hello, can you hear me? I've got to get you out. Martin listened. There was no answer. There wasn't even an imaginary answer. He forced his head further down so that he could see deeper into the crevice, but there was nobody there, nobody crying, nobody calling out, no pale, distressed face looking back up at him. He had actually reached the bottom of the bed and was looking over the edge of the mattress into the tightly tucked dead end of blankets and sheets. He had a choice. But there was very little time. Either he could climb down Leg's elbow to see if he could find where the boy was trapped, or else he could give up his rescue mission and turn back. In less than 20 minutes, the caves would be completely flooded and anybody down here would be drowned. He decided to risk it. It would take him only seven or eight minutes to climb all the way down Leg's elbow and another five to crawl back as far as the sump. Once he was back through the sump, the caves rose quite steeply towards the surface so that he would have a fair chance of escaping before they filled up with water. He pushed his way over the edge of Leg's elbow and began to inch down the crevice. He could slip at any moment, and his arms and legs were shaking with effort. He could feel the limestone walls starting to move, a long, slow, seismic slide that made him feel as if the whole world were collapsing all around him. If Leg's elbow fell in, he'd be trapped, unable to climb back out. But more and more rainwater gushed into the underground caverns. Panting with effort, he tried to cling onto the sides of the crevice. There was one moment when he thought he was going to be able to heave himself back. But then everything slid. Sheets, blankets, limestone, rock, he ended up right at the bottom of Leg's elbow, buried alive. For a moment, he panicked. He could hardly breathe. But then he started to pull at the fallen rock slide tearing a way out of the crevice stone by stone. There had to have been a way out. If there was a deep lower cavern, perhaps he could climb down to the foot of the hill and crawl out of the fox's earth or any other fissure that he could locate. After all, if the rainwater could find an escape route to the limestone, he was sure that he could. He managed to heave all the rocks aside. Now all he had to do was burrow through the sludge. He took great handfuls of it and dragged it behind him, until at last he felt the flow of fresh air into the crevice. Fresh air and wind. He crawled out of Leg's elbow on his hands and knees and found himself lying on a flat, sandy beach. The day was pearly gray, but the sun was high in the sky, and the ocean peacefully glittered in the distance. He turned around and saw that behind him there was nothing but miles and miles of gray tussocky grass. Somehow he had emerged from these tussocks like somebody emerging from underneath a heavy blanket. He stood up, brushed himself down. He was still wearing his waterproof jacket and his potholing boots. He was glad of them, because the breeze was thin and chilly. Up above him, white gulls circled and circled, not mewing or crying, their eyes as expressionless as sharks' eyes. 
In the sand at his feet, tiny iridescent shells were embedded. For a moment, he was unable to decide what he ought to do next and where he ought to go. Perhaps he should try to crawl back into the pothole and retrace his route to the surface, but he was out in the open air here, and it didn't seem to be any point in it. Besides, the pothole was heavily covered in grass, and it was difficult to see exactly where it was. He thought he ought to walk inland a short way, to see if he could find a road or a house or any indication of where he might be. But then, very far away, where the sea met the sky, he saw a small fishing boat drawing into the shore and a man climbing out of it. The fishing boat had a russet-colored triangular sail, like a fishing boat in an old-fashioned watercolor. He started to walk towards it, and then, when he realized how far it was, he started to run. His waterproof jacket made a chuffing noise as his boots left deep impressions in the sand. The seagulls kept pace with him, circling and circling. Running and walking, it took him almost 20 minutes to reach the fishing boat. A white-bearded man in olive-colored oilskins had knelt down beside it, stringing fat triangular fish on the line. The fish were brilliant. They shone with every color of the rainbow. Some of them were still alive, thrashing their tails and blowing their gills. Martin stopped a few yards away and watched and said nothing. Eventually, the man stopped stringing fish and looked up at him. He was handsome in an old-fashioned way, chiseled like Charlton Heston. But his eyes were completely blank, the color of sky on an overcast day. He reminded Martin of somebody familiar, but he couldn't think who he was. Not far away, sitting cross-legged on a coil of rope, was a thin young boy in a hooded coat. He was playing a thin plant of tune on a flute. His wrists were so thin, and the tune was so sad, that Martin almost felt like crying. Well, you came at last, said the man with the eyes of the color of the sky. We've been waiting for you. Waiting for me? Why? You're a tunneler, aren't you? You do your best work on the ground. I was looking for a boy. He was supposed to be stuck at Leg's elbow, but I, I don't know. The whole cave system was flooded. It seemed to collapse. And you thought you'd escaped. I, I did escape. The man stood up, his waterproofs creaking. He smelled strongly of fresh-caught fish, all that slime on their scales. That was only a way of bringing you here. You need to help us, an experienced tunneler like you. What do you think of this fish? I never saw fish like that before. They're not fish. Not in the strictest sense of the word, they're more like ideas. He picked one up so that it twisted and shimmered, and Martin could see that it was an idea rather than a fish. It was an idea about being angry with people you loved, and how you could explain that you loved them and calm them down. And the man held up another fish, and this was a different fish altogether, a different idea. This was a glittering idea about numbers, how the meter was measured by the speed of light. If light could be compressed, then distance could too and the implications of that were quite startling. Martin couldn't really understand how the fish managed to be ideas as well as fish, but they were, and some of the ideas were so beautiful and strange that he stood staring at them and feeling as if his whole life was turning under his feet. The sun began to descend towards the horizon. A small boy put away his flute and helped the fisherman gather the last of his lines and his nets. The fisherman gave Martin a large wooden basket to carry full of blue glass fishing floats and complicated reels. We'll have to put our best foot forward if we want to get home before dark. They walked for a while in silence. The breeze blew the sand and sizzling snakes. And behind them, the soft sea applauded like a faraway audience. After four or five minutes, though, Martin said, Why do you need a tunneler? The fisherman gave him a quick sideways glance. You may not believe it. There's another world apart from this one. A place that exists right next to us, like the world that you can see when you're in a mirror. Essentially the same, but different. What does that have to do with tunneling? Everything. Because there's only one way through this world, 
and that's by crawling into your bed and through to the other side. Martin stopped in his tracks. What are you talking about? Beds. I I tunneled into caves and, and potholes, not beds. There's no difference, said the fisherman. Caves, beds, they're just the same. A way through to somewhere else. Martin started walking again. Look, you'd better explain yourself. The sun had almost reached the horizon now, and their shadows were giant, with stilt-like legs and distant, pin-sized heads. And there isn't much time to explain. There's another world beneath the blankets. Some people can find it, some can't. I suppose it depends on their imagination. My daughter, Lenora, always had... the imagination. She used to hide under the blankets, pretend that she was a cave dweller in prehistoric times, or a, a red Indian woman in a tent. But about a month ago, she said that she had found the other world. Right at the very bottom of the bed. She could see it. But she couldn't wriggle her way into it. Did she describe it? The fisherman nodded. She said it was dark, very dark. With tangled thorn bushes and branchy trees. She said that she could see shadows moving around and it shadows that could have... Could have been animals. Like wolves. Or hunched up men wearing black fur cloaks doesn't sound like the kind of world that anybody would want to visit. We never had the chance to find out where the Lenora went because she wanted to. Two days ago, my wife went to her bedroom and discovered that her bed was empty. We thought at first that she might have run away. We had no family arguments. She, all, she really had no cause to. When we stripped back her blankets, we found that the lower parts of the sheets were torn as if some kind of animal had been clawing at it. He paused. And then he said with some difficulty, We found blood too. Not very much. Maybe she scratched herself on one of those thorns. Maybe maybe one of the animals clawed her. By now, they had reached the grassy dunes and started to climb up. Not far away, there were three small cottages. Two painted white and one painted pink, with lights in the windows and fishing nets hung up all around them for repair. Didn't you try going after her yourself? Asked Martin. Yes. It was no use. I don't have enough imagination. All I could see was sheets, blankets. I fish for rational ideas, for astronomy, physics, human logic. I couldn't imagine an underbed. So I couldn't visit it. Underbed. The fisherman gave him a small grin. That's what Lenora called it. They reached the cottage and laid down all their baskets and tackle. The kitchen door opened and a woman came out, wiping her hands on a flowery apron. Her blonde hair was braided on top of her head and she was quite beautiful in an odd, expressionless way, as if she were a, a component of oil painting rather than a real woman. Well, you're back then, she said, and this is the tunneler. The fisherman laid his hand on Martin's shoulder. That's right. Came just like he was supposed to. He can start to look for her tonight. Martin was about to protest. But the woman came up and took hold of both of his hands. I know you'll do everything you can, she told him. And God bless you for coming here and trying. They had supper that evening, around the kitchen table. A rich fish pie with a crispy potato crust. Glasses of cold cider. The fisherman and his wife said very little, but scarcely took their eyes away from Martin once. It was almost as if they were frightened that he was going to vanish into thin air. On the mantelpiece, a plain wooden clock loudly ticked out the time, and on the wall next to it hung a watercolor of a house that for some reason Martin recognized. There was a woman standing in the garden, with her back to him. He felt that if she were able to turn around, he would know at once who she was. There were other artifacts in the room that he recognized. A big green earthenware jug and a pastille burner in the shape of a little cottage. There was a china cat, too, which stared at him 
with a knowing smile. He had never been here before, so he couldn't imagine why all these things looked so familiar. Perhaps he was tired, suffering from deja vu. After supper, they sat around the range for a while, and the fisherman explained how he went out traveling every day for idea fish. In the deeper water around the sound, there were much bigger fish, entire theoretical concepts swimming in shoals. This is the land of ideas, he said in a matter-of-fact way. Even the swallows and thrusses in the sky are little whimsical thoughts. You can catch a swallow, think of something you once forgot. I have a small, sweet notion you never would have had before. You, you come from the land of action, where things are done, and not just discussed. An underbed? What kind of land is that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, the land of fear, I suppose. Land of darkness, where everything always threatens to go wrong. And that's where you want me to go looking for your daughter? The fisherman's wife got up from her chair, lifted a photograph from the mantelpiece, and passed it across to Martin without a word. It showed a young blonde girl standing on the seashore in a thin summer dress. She was pale-eyed and captivatingly pretty. Her bare toes were buried in the sand. In the distance, a flock of birds were scattering, and Martin... Martin thought of a small, sweet notion that she never would have had before. Martin studied the photograph for a moment, then gave it back. Very well. I'll have to try. After all, it was his duty to rescue people. He hadn't been able to find that boy trapped in Leg's elbow. Perhaps he could redeem himself by finding Lenora. Just after eleven o'clock, they showed him across to his room. It was small and plain, except for a pine dressing table, crowded with dolls and soft toys. The plain pine bed stood right in the middle of a longer wall with an engraving of a park hanging over it. Martin frowned at the engraving more closely. He was sure that the park was familiar. Perhaps he had visited it when he was a child. But here, in the land of ideas? The fisherman's wife closed the red gingham curtains, folded down the blankets on the bed. Do you still have the sheets from the time she disappeared? Martin asked. She nodded and opened a small pine linen chest at the foot of the bed. She lifted out the folded white sheets and spread it on top of the bed. One end was ripped and snagged, as if it had been caught in machinery or clawed by something at least as big as a tiger. She wouldn't have done this herself, said the fisherman. She couldn't have. Still, said Martin, she didn't do it. What did? By midnight, Martin was in bed wearing a long, white, borrowed nightshirt, and the cottage was immersed in darkness. The breeze persistently rattled the window sash like somebody trying to get in, and beyond the dunes, Martin could hear the sea. He always thought that there was nothing more lonely than the sea at night. He didn't know whether he believed in underbed or not. He didn't even know if he believed in the land of ideas or not. He felt as if he was... Caught in a dream. And how could he be? The bed felt real, and the pillows felt real, and he could make out his pot-holding clothing hanging over the back of the chair. He lay on his back for almost fifteen minutes without moving. Then he decided he'd better take a look down at the end of the bed, and after all, if underbed didn't exist, the worst that could happen to him was that he would end up half-stifled and hot. He lifted the blankets, twisted himself around, and plunged down beneath them. Immediately, he found himself crawling in a low, pady crevice that was thickly tangled with tree roots. His nostrils were filled with a rank odor of wet leaves and mold. He would have wriggled into a gap beneath the floor of a wood or forest. It was impenetrably dark, and the roots snared his hair and scratched his face. He was sure that he could feel black beetles crawling across his hands and down the back of his collar. He wasn't wearing night clothes any longer. Instead, he was ruggedly dressed in a thick, checkered shirt and heavy dewy jeans. After 40 or 50 meters, he had to crawl right because of the bowl of a large tree. Part of it was badly rotted, and he'd inched his way through the clinging tap roots. He was unnervingly aware that the tree probably weighed several tons, and if he disturbed it, 
They could collapse into the subterranean crevice and crush him completely. He had to dig through heaps of peat and soil, and at one point his fingers clawed into something both crackly and slimy. It was the decomposed body of a badger that must have become trapped underneath. He stopped for a moment, suffocated and sickened, but then he heard the huge tree creaking and showers of damp peat falling into his hair, and he knew that if he didn't get out of there quickly, he was going to be buried alive. He squirmed out from under the tree, pulling aside a thick curtain of hairy roots, and discovered that he was out in the open air. It was still nighttime and very cold, and his breath smoked in the way that he and his friends had pretended to smoke on winter mornings when they waited for the bus for school. Which was when? Yesterday? Or months ago? Or even years ago? He stood in the forest. There was no moon, yet the forest was faintly lit by an eerie phosphorescence. He imagined that aliens might have landed behind the trees, a vast spaceship filled with narrow, complicated chambers where the space mechanics might be lost for months. Squeezing his pelvis through angular bulkheads and impossibly constrictive service tunnels. The forest was silent. No insects chirped, no wind disturbed the trees. The only sound was that of Martin's footsteps as he made his way cautiously through the brambles, not sure in which direction that he should be heading. Yet he felt that he was going the right way. He felt drawn, magnetized, almost like a quivering compass needle. He was plunging deeper and deeper into the land of underbed. A land of airlessness and claustrophobia, a land in which most people couldn't even breathe, but to him it was the land of closeness and complete security. Up above him, the branches were so thickly entwined together that it was impossible to see the sky. It could have been daytime up above, but here in the forest it was always night. He stumbled onward for over half an hour. Every now and then he stopped and listened, but the forest remained silent. As he walked on, he became aware of something pale, flickering behind the trees right in the very corner of his eye. He stopped again and turned around, but it disappeared. Whatever it was. Is anybody there? He called out, his voice muffled by the encroaching trees. There was no answer, but now Martin was certain that he could hear dry leaves being shuffled and twigs being softly snapped. He was certain that he could hear somebody breathing. He walked further and was conscious of the pale shape following him like a paper lantern on a stick, bobbing from tree to tree just out of sight, but although it remained invisible, it became noisier and noisier its breath coming in short, harsh gasps, its feet rustling faster and faster across the forest floor. Suddenly, something clutched at his shirt sleeve, a hand or a claw, and ripped the fabric. He twisted around and almost lost his balance. Standing close to him in the phosphorescent gloom was a girl of sixteen or seventeen, very slender and white-faced. Her hair was wild and straw-like, and back combed into a large bird's nest decorated with thorns and holly and moss and shiny maroon berries. Her irises were charcoal gray, night skies, with wide black pupils, eyes that could see in the dark. Her face was starved looking, but mesmerically pretty. It was her white, white skin that made Martin believe that he was being followed by a paper lantern. Her costume was extraordinary and erotic. She wore a short blouse made of hundreds of bunched up ruffles of grubby, tattered lace, but every ruffle seemed to be decorated with a bead or metal or a rabbit's foot or a bird fashioned out of cooking foil, but her blouse reached only as far as her navel, and it was all she wore. Her feet were filthy, and her thighs were streaked with mud. What are you searching for? She asked him in a thin, lisping voice. Martin was so confused and embarrassed by her half-nakedness that he turned away. I'm looking for someone, that's all. Nobody's looking for anybody here. This is Underbed. Well, I'm looking for somebody, a girl named Le Lenora. A girl who came out from under the woods? I suppose so, yes. We saw her passing by. She was searching for whatever it is... It makes her frightened, but she won't find it here. I thought this was the land of fear. 
oh, it is. But there's a difference between fear, isn't there? And what actually makes you frightened. I, I don't understand. It's easy. Fear of the dark is only a fear. It isn't anything real. What about things that really do hide in the dark? What about the coat on the back of your chair that isn't a coat at all? What about your dead friend standing in the corner next to your wardrobe waiting for you to wait? So what is Lenora looking for? It depends what's been frightening her, doesn't it? But the way she went, she was heading for under, under bed. That's where the darkest things live. Can you show me that way? girl empathically shook her hand, so that her beads rattled and her ribbons shook. You don't know what the darkest things are, do you? She covered her face with her hands, her fingers slightly parted so that only her eyes looked out. The darkest things are the very darkest things, and once you go to visit them in under under bed, they'll know which way you came. They'll be able to smell you. They'll follow you back there. Martin said, I still have to find Leonora. Yeah, I promised. The girl stared at him for a long, long time, saying nothing as if she were sure that she would never see him again and wanted to remember what he looked like. Then she turned away and beckoned him to follow. They walked through the forest for at least another twenty minutes. The branches grew sharper and denser, and Martin's cheeks and ears were badly scratched, all the same with his arms raised to protect his eyes. He followed the girl's thin, pale back as she guided him deeper and deeper into the trees. As she walked, she sang a high-pitched song. The days in disguise, they're wearing a face I don't recognize. It has rings on its fingers and silken robes in its eyes. Eventually, they reached a small clearing. On one side, the ground had humped up and was thickly covered with sodden green moss. Without hesitation, the girl crouched down and lifted up one side of the moss like a blanket, revealing a dark, root-wriggling interior. Down there? asked Martin in alarm. The girl nodded. But remember what I said. Once you find them, they'll follow you back. That's what happens when you go looking for the darkest things. All the same, I promised. Yes, but just think who you promised and why, and just think who Lenora might be, and who am I, and what it is you're doing here. I don't know, he admitted, and he didn't, but while the girl held the moss blanket as high as she could, he climbed on his side and worked his way underneath it, feet first, as if he were climbing into bed. The roots embraced him. They took him into their arms like thin-fingered women, and soon he was buried in the mossy hump up to his neck. The girl knelt beside him, and her face was calm and regretful. For some reason, her nakedness didn't embarrass him anymore. It was almost as if he knew her too well. But without saying any more, she lowered the blanket of moss over his face, and his world went completely dark. He took a deep, damp-tasting breath, and then he began to insinuate his way under the ground, at first he was crawling quite level, but he soon reached a place where the soil dropped sharply away into absolute blackness. He thought he could feel a faint drafting blow and the dull sound of hammering and knocking. This must be it. The end of Underbed. Where Under Underbed began. This was where the darkest things lived. Not just the fear, but the reality. For the first time since he had set out on his rescue mission, he was tempted to turn back. If he crawled back out of that moss blanket now, went back through the forest, then the darkest things would never know that he had been here. But he knew that he had to continue. Once you plunged into bed, and under bed, and under under bed, you had committed yourself. He swung his legs over the edge of the precipice, clinging with both hands on the roots that sprouted out of the soil like hairs on a giant's head. Little by little, he lowered himself down the face of the precipice, his shoes sliding in the peat and bringing down noisy cascades of earth and pebbles. The most frightening part about his descent was that he couldn't see anything at all. He couldn't even see how far down he had to climb. For all he knew, the precipice went down and down and down forever. 
Every time he clutched at a root, he couldn't help himself from dragging off its fibrous outer covering, and his hands soon became impossibly slippery with sap. Below him, however, the hammering had grown much more louder, and he could hear echoes, too, and double echoes. He grasped a large taproot, and immediately his hand slipped. He tried to snatch a handful of smaller roots, but they all tore away with a sound like rotten curtains tearing. He clawed at the soil itself, but there was nothing that he could do to stop himself from falling. He thought for an instant, I'm going to die. He fell heavily through a damp, lath, and plastered ceiling. With an ungainly wallop, he landed on a sodden mattress and tumbled off of it onto the wet carpeted floor. He lay on his side for a moment, winded, but then he managed to twist himself around and climb up to his knees. He was in a bedroom. A bedroom which he recognized, although the wallpaper was mildewed and peeling, and the, and the closet door was tilted off its hinges to reveal a row of empty wire hangers. He stood up and went across to the window. At first he thought that it was nighttime, but then he realized the window was completely filled with peat. The bedroom was buried deep below the ground. He began to feel the first tight little flutter of panic. What if he couldn't climb his way out of here? What if he had to spend the rest of his life buried deep below the surface, under layers of layers of layers of soil and moss and suffocating blankets? He tried to think what he thought to do next, but the hammering was now so loud that it made the floor tremble and the hangers in the closet jingle together. He had to take control of himself. He was an expert after all, a fully trained potholer with 30 years experience. His first priority was to find Leonora and see how difficult it was going to be to get her back up to the precipice. Perhaps there was another way out of under under bed, which didn't involve 20 or 30 meters of dangerous climbing. He opened the bedroom door and found himself confined by a long corridor with a shiny linoleum floor. The walls were lined with doors and painted with a tan dado, like a school or a hospital. A single naked light hung at the very far end of the corridor, and under this light stood a girl with a long white nightgown. Her blonde hair was flying in an unfelt wind and her face was so white, it could have been sculpted out of chalk. The hem of her nightgown was ripped into tatters and spattered with blood. Her calves and her feet were savagely clawed, with the skin hanging down in ribbons and blood running all over the floor. Leonora? said Martin, too softly for the girl to be able to hear. Then, Leonora? She took one shuffling step towards him, and another... But then she stopped and leaned against the side of the corridor. It was the same Leonora whose photograph had been seen in the fisherman's catalog, but three or four years older, maybe. Maybe more. Martin started to walk towards her. As he passed each door along the corridor, it seemed to fly open by itself. The hammering was deafening now, but the rooms on either side were empty. Even though he could see armchairs and sofas and coffee tables and paintings on the walls, they were like... Tableau from someone's life, year by year, decade by decade. Lenora, he said, and took her into his arms. She was very cold and shivering. Come on, Leonora, we have to take you home. There's no way out, she whispered in a voice like blanched almonds. The darkest things are coming and there's no way out. There's always a way out. Come on, I'll carry you. There's no way out, she screamed at him, right in his face. We're buried too deep and there's no way out. Don't panic. Don't panic, he shouted back at her. If we go back to the bedroom, we can find a way to climb back up to under bed. Now come on, let me carry you. He bent down a bit and then heaved her up onto his shoulders. She weighed hardly anything at all. Her feet were badly lacerated. Two of her left toes were dangling by nothing but skin, and blood dripped steadily on the Martin's jeans. As they made their way back down the corridor, the door slammed shut in the same way that they had flown open. But they were still ten or eleven meters away from the bedroom door when Leonora clutched him so tightly round the throat that she almost strangled him and screamed, They're here! The dark things! They're following us! Martin turned around just as the light bulb at the end of the corridor was shattering. In a single instant of light, however, he was able to make out something terrible. It looked like a tall, thin man in a gray, monkish hood. 
Its face was beatifically perfect as the effigy of a saint. Perfect, that is, except for its mouth, which was drawn back in a lustful grin, revealing a jungle of irregular pointed teeth. And below that mouth, in another lustful grin, a second mouth with a thin tongue tip that lashed from side to side as if it couldn't wait to start feeding. Both its arms were raised so that its sleeves had dropped back, exposing not hands, but hooked black claws. This was one of the darkest things, the darkest thing that Leonora had feared and had to face. In the sudden blackness, Martin was disoriented and thrown off balance. He half dropped Leonora, but he managed to heft her up again and stumble in the direction of the bedroom. He found the door, groped it open, and then slammed it shut behind them and turned the key. Hurry, he said. You have to climb to the bedhead and up to the ceiling. They heard a thick, shuffling noise in the corridor outside and an appalling screeching of claws against the painted plaster walls. The bedroom door shook with a sudden collision and plaster showered down from the lintel. There was another blow. And then the claws scratched slowly down the door panels. Martin turned around. In spite of her injured feet, Leonora had managed to balance herself on the brass bed rail. And now she was painfully trying to pull herself through the hole in the damaged ceiling. He struggled up on the mattress to help her, and as the door was shaken yet again, she managed to climb through. Martin followed, his hands torn by splinters. As he drew his legs up, the bedroom door racketed open, and he glimpsed the hooded gray figure with its upraised claws. It raised its head and looked up at him, and both its mouths opened in mockery and greed. The climb up the precipice seemed to take months. Together, Martin and Leonora inched their way up through soft, collapsed peat, using even the frailest of roots for handholds. Several times they slipped back. Again and again they were showered with soil and pebbles and leaf mold. Martin had to spit it out of his mouth and rub it out of his eyes. And all that time they knew that the darkest thing was following them, hungry and triumphant, and that it would always follow them, wherever they went. Unexpectedly, they reached the crest of the precipice. Leonora was weeping with pain and exhaustion, but Martin took hold of her arm and dragged her through the roots and the soft, giving soil until at last they finally came to the blanket of moss. He lifted it up with his arms, trembling with exhaustion, and Leonora climbed out from under it and into the clearing. Martin, gasping with effort, followed her. There were no signs of the forest girl anywhere. So Martin had to guess the way back. Both he and Leonora were too tired to speak, but they kept on pushing their way through the branches, side by side. There was no doubt of their companionship. They'd escaped from under underbed. And now, they were making their way through underbed, and up to the world of light and fresh air. It took Martin far longer than he thought to find the underground cavity, which would take them back to Lenora's world. But a strong sense of direction kept him going. A sense that they would make their way upwards. Just when he thought that they were lost for good, he felt his fingers grasping the sheets instead of soil, and he and Leonora climbed out of her rumpled bed into her bedroom. Her father was sitting beside the bed, and when they emerged, he embraced them both and skipped an odd little fisherman's dance. You're a brave boy. You're a, you're a brave boy bringing my Leonora back to me. Martin smeared his face with his hands. She's going to need treatment on her feet. Is there a doctor close by? No, but the lady's smock and marigold's a miracle for dismissing bad dreams. Her toes are almost severed. She needs stitches. She needs a doctor. An ideal will do as well as a doctor. There's something else, said Martin. A thing that hurt her. I think it's probably following us. The fisherman laid his hand on Martin's shoulder and nodded. We'll take care of that, my young fellow. So... They stood by the shore in the mauvish light of an early summer's evening, and they set fire to Leonora's bed, blankets and sheets and all, and they, they pushed it out to sea like an Arthurian funeral barge. The flames lapped into the sky like dragon's tongues, and fragments of burned blanket whirled into the air. Leonora, with her bandaged feet, stood close to Martin and held his hand, and when it was time for him to go, she kissed him and her eyes were filled with tears. The fisherman gratefully clasped his hands. Always remember, he said. What might have been is just as important as what actually was. Martin nodded. And then 
he started walking back along the shoreline to the Tasaki grass that would lead him back to Leg's Elbow and the caves. He turned around only once, but by then it was too dark to see anything but the fire burning by Leonore's bed. 300 meters out to sea. His mother frantically stripped back his sheets and blankets in the morning and found him at the bottom of the bed with his red and white striped pajamas, his skin cold, his limbs stiff with rigor mortis. There was no saving him. The doctor said that he had probably suffocated sometime after midnight. And by the time his mother found him, he had been dead for seven and a half hours. When he was cremated, his mother wept and said that it was just as if Martin was a life that had never happened. But who could say such a thing? Not the fisherman and his family, who went back to their imaginary cottage, said a prayer for the tunneler who rescued their daughter. Not a wild, half-naked girl who walked through a forest that never was, thinking of a man who dared to face the darkest things. And not the darkest thing, which heaved itself out from under the moss and emerged at last in the world of ideas from a smoking, half-sunken bed, a hooded gray shape in the darkness. And in the end, not Martin's mother. When she went back into his bedroom after the funeral and stripped the bed, she pulled back the blankets one last time. And she tugged off the sheets. But it was just when she was dragging out the sheets from the very end of the bed that she saw six curved black shapes over the end of the mattress. She frowned and walked around the bed to see what they were. It was only when she really looked she realized they were claws. Cautiously, she dragged down the sheets a little further. The claws were attached to a hand, and the hand seemed to disappear into the crack between the sheet and the mattress. This was a joke, she thought. Some really sick joke. Martin had been dead for less than a week, and someone was playing some childish, hurtful prank. She wrenched back the sheet even further and seized hold of one of the claws so that she could pull it free. And to her horror, it lashed out at her and tore the flesh on the back of her hand. It lashed again and again, ripping the mattress and shredding the sheets. She screamed and tried to scramble away, her blood spotting the sheets, but something rose out from the end of the bed. In a tumult of torn foam and ripped apart padding, something tall and gray with a face like a saint and two parallel mouths crammed with shark's teeth. It rose up and up until it towered above her and it was cold as the Arctic. It was so cold that even her breath fumed. There are some places you should never go, it whispered at her with both mouths speaking in unison. There are some things you should never think about. There are some people whose curiosity will always bring calamity, especially to themselves and to the people they love. You don't need to go looking for fears. Your fears will always follow you and find you out. And without hesitation, the darkest thing brought down its right hand claw like a cat swatting at thrush and ripped her face apart. Before she could fall to the carpet, it ripped her again, and then again, until the whole bedroom was decorated with blood. It bent down then, almost as if it were kneeling in reverence to its own cruelty and its own greed, and it firmly seized her flesh with both of its mouths. Gradually, it disappeared back into the crevice of the end of the bed, dragging her with it inch by inch, one lolling leg, one flopping arm. The last to go was her left hand. With her wedding ring on it, there was nothing but a torn, blood-stained bed in an empty room and a faint sound that could have been water trickling down through underground caves or the sea, whispering in the distance, or the rustling of branches in a deep, dark forest. This year's 13-day Halloween countdown is in support of Dark Places, Evil Faces, a new collection brought to you by PS Publishing, 
and features New York Times bestsellers, some of horror's most prolific authors, and Vincent Venacaba. Sales of the book Dark Places, Evil Faces goes to the Macmillan Cancer Support. It's a charity based out of the UK that gives aid to people and families suffering from cancer. So, this Halloween, I hope you all enjoy the stories, and I hope we can do some good in the world. Sweet dreams. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, and thank you all for listening. Please help support the channel at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and make sure to tune in for new horror stories every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night. Many of the horror authors that I've worked with throughout this channel have all come together to work on one big book series, The Creepypasta Collections Volume 1 and 2. Check them out on Amazon or at any local bookstore near you. Thanks for listening, kids, and sweet dreams. <laughs>